Good evening. My name is Mofei Shayo Ayadele and I'm a student projects manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program, Russia Resurgent, Crisis in the Caucasus. A hostile conflict developed last month in the Caucasus when Russian military forces invaded the Republic of Georgia on August 8th. Georgia is one of 15 former republics that achieved independence after the disintegration of the USSR in 1991. The Russian government asserts the position that its military forces intervened in, the support, in support of the separatist movements in the South Ossetia region, which has been seeking independence from Georgia since the 1990s. Russia exacerbated the situation on August 26 by formally recognizing the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. The United States has provided support for the Georgian government and its president, Mikhail Saakashvili, and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice has termed Russian actions regrettable. Today's panel includes experts on Russia, Eurasia, and American foreign policy who will discuss the current crisis and the implications of Russia's resurgence for American foreign policy and U.S.-Russia relations. Professor Russell Bova of the Political Science and International Studies Departments at Dickinson is the moderator of our panel. His fields are comparative politics and international relations with the special interest in post-communist Russia and East Europe. Members of our panel include Professor Andrew Wolf, an expert on United States foreign policy and a professor of political science and international studies here at Dickinson. Professor Craig Nation is a specialist on Russian and Eurasian affairs at the U.S. Army War College. Elena Isakova is a visiting scholar from the Russian State University for the Humanities and has just recently arrived from Russia. Neil Weissman has a PhD in Russian history from Princeton and was a professor in Dickinson's history department before he became provost and dean of Dickinson College, a position he currently holds. At this time, I would like to ask that you turn off all cell phones and electronic devices. Please hold all questions until the question and answer session at the end of the program. Because this event is being taped and some audience members may be hearing impaired, please wait until the microphone has been brought to you before beginning to speak. And now please join me in welcoming our panelists. Uh, thank, you very, uh, thank you very much. Um, very nice to see such a big crowd here on a rainy Carlisle uh, Tuesday night. Um, I'm Professor Bova, and um, as the moderator of the panel, I thought what I would do is start by just giving a very, uh, brief, uh, some very brief background on the region. Uh, and I was prompted to do so by something I read in a web blog that I uh, was looking through uh, shortly after uh, the Russian invasion of Georgia in, in early August. Um, uh, the web blog had a link to another site on Yahoo where people can, I guess, um, send in questions and get answers to things that are on their mind. And uh, this particular question went something as follows. Uh, it was from a woman who lives outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And she wrote, I just saw on TV that Russia has invaded Georgia. But I looked outside the window, and I don't notice anything going on. Is it safe to go outdoors? Um, so I'm sure nobody in this room would make that, uh, that mistake. But uh, uh, what I thought, nonetheless, I would do, in all seriousness, because this is a part of the world uh, where uh, many Americans, uh, even you know, very good uh, students at a school like Dickinson College, might not pay a lot of attention to you know, what's happening in the Caucasus region, except when something happens in the news uh, that uh, brings it to our attention. So what I thought I'd do is very briefly just throw a couple of maps up and then turn it over to the panelists to do the uh, heavy lifting and uh, tell us what all, this, uh, what all this means. Well, we'll save some time at the end for comments and then questions from the audience as well. Uh, Georgia, for those of you who are not, that particular, uh, not uh, particularly familiar with the region, uh, is located in uh, the region uh, known as the Caucasus, which is this uh, strip of land here uh, sandwiched in between the Caspian uh, and the Black Sea. Uh, Georgia itself has a population of about five, uh, five million people. And the region in general, uh, because of a combination of geographical and historical factors, uh, is a very diverse region, both linguistically uh, and, uh, and culturally. And in looking at the, and hearing the news reports over the last uh, uh, month or so, 
Uh, we've all, if you weren't before, become familiar, familiar with a couple of the peoples uh, of this region, uh, besides the Georgians themselves. Um, we have uh, the, the, uh, uh, the people who live in South Ossetia, the Ossetians, which you can see. I don't, does this have a, uh, there we go. Uh, <coughs> South Ossetia, where the uh, Russian invasion in early August took place. Uh, South Ossetia, uh, or I should say Ossetians in general, number about 700,000, but most of them live uh, in North Ossetia, which is in Russia, which is in Russia proper. Uh, the, uh, uh, the number of people who live in uh, South Ossetia uh, is, is, much, uh, is much smaller. About 10% uh, of Ossetians live in, in South Ossetia, about 70,000. Uh, South Ossetia is about two-thirds Ossetian, uh, approximately roughly one-third Georgian with some Russians and others uh, mixed in as well. Uh, if you've been following the news, uh, you note that after the, uh, the early August uh, uh, invasion of South Ossetia, uh, there was also military action that took place in another region of Georgia, Abkhazia, uh, uh, which uh, is another region which has sought uh, uh, autonomy uh, and independence from Georgia uh, since 1991. Uh, Abkhazians number in total about 200,000, with about half of them living in Abkhazia itself, the others, again, scattered other places uh, in the region, including Turkey, uh, a few other places as well. Um, Georgia itself, let me go to the next slide here quickly. There we go. Georgia itself, of course, uh, as the student who introduced the panel today uh, indicated, Georgia itself was a part of the former Soviet Union. What we see here is a map of the post-Soviet space. The big green, is, of course, is uh, the Russian Federation. Uh, the yellow uh, countries are now the other 14 republics of what previously constituted uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and this is Georgia right over here. Now, one thing important to note, and that is when the Soviet Union disintegrated, uh, the disintegration took place along the lines defined by the Union Republics of the former Soviet Union. There were 15 Union Republics. Uh, once you get down from the all-Union level, the Union Republics were the next largest uh, political unit, the next uh, layer down, if you will, uh, in the Soviet administrative structure. So those uh, uh, re union republics, including Georgia, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, uh, Belarus, uh, the Baltic states, and so forth, uh, they all got independence, but the line was drawn at further subdivision of regions that were contained within one of those larger union republics. So for example, uh, the case we're probably most familiar with from the 1990s was, Chech was Chechnya, which is located just north of Georgia here. Uh, Chechnya is a, was a part of the Russian Federation, and we all know what the Russian reaction to autonomy movements in Chechnya was, both under Yeltsin and later under uh, Vladimir Putin as well. Uh, and so Ossetia and Abkhazia, I don't want to carry the, the, the analogy too far, but there's a kind of similarity here insofar as South Ossetia and Abkhazia are uh, uh, regions within Georgia uh, to which the idea of uh, post-Soviet independence and post-Soviet sovereignty, like in the case of Chechnya, uh, was, not, uh, was, not, was not extended. Uh, for the Russians, and uh, my last point, and I'll turn it over to the panelists, uh, for the Russians, uh, even though these states of the former Soviet Union are now independent, they have their own flags, they have seats in the UN, they have formal diplomatic recognition by most of the countries around the world, uh, for, for many Russians, uh, the, this is still part of the, sort of what the Russians once called the near abroad, the post-Soviet space, uh, the, the, the Russian sphere of influence, whatever term you want to use. Uh, in Russia, in the Kremlin, there is a sense that the relationship between these regions and Russia, uh, going back in many cases even before the Soviet period, uh, is a relationship that needs special consideration uh, in this era in which we're, uh, which we're now living. Okay, so with that as a brief background, I want to turn it over to our panelists. Uh, what I've asked each of our panelists to do uh, is really the impossible, to take no more than 10 minutes apiece and to just say a few words, raising some issues, uh, making some observations, giving us something to think about, uh, and then extend the discussion further in the uh, comments in the Q&A. Uh, and if any of you uh, students in there have a professor, uh, you know it's hard to uh, ask, get a professor to tell you his name in 10 minutes, let alone explain you know, uh, you know, dramatic international events of the sort we have here. So I'm asking uh, them to do a difficult, uh, it's a difficult task, but uh, I'm sure they're all up to it. So our first speaker will be uh, Craig Nation from the U.S. Army War House. Uh, do these uh, microphones work? You're good. R Russ uh, asked us uh, to stay to 10 minutes. He, he also demanded it. I, I, I work at the Army War College, and I appreciate that. He said, after 10 minutes, I'm going to shut you down. Okay, 10 minutes. Uh, I have to start 
Uh, my name is Craig Nation. I have to, I'm an uh, employee of the Department of the Army, so I should start with a standard uh, uh, declaimer. That is, I'm speaking on my own behalf tonight, and my remarks don't necessarily reflect uh, the official positions of the Department of the Army, Department of Defense, United States government, my wife, son, or anyone else uh, but me. Um, the thing that strikes me when I look at this conflict we're discussing tonight most strongly is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, uh, the uh, gap between uh, what, what I, I perceive as a very strong rhetorical reaction in the United States and elsewhere, uh, matched up against a very modest and cautious uh, policy uh, a reaction. Uh, the, the rhetoric has been exaggerated. Uh, uh, there have been endless references to a new Cold War. This is a new Cold War, although there have been, you know, the new Cold War has broken out at least six times, I think, in the last eight years. But the new Cold War. This big of Brzezinski said this is uh, a replay of the Winter War, the uh, Soviet uh, Finnish conflict, which is a prelude uh, to the Second World War uh, in Europe. Uh, uh, again and again, this is a, a fundamental turning point, a, venda, uh, you know, a, a whole new climate of international relations is going to result as a consequence of this, uh, of this action. It's been, uh, been uh, heightened rhetoric, but our policy responses have in fact been, I think it's fair to call them, uh, very restrained and very cautious. So how to explain that dichotomy, that uh, you could even say apparent contradiction. I, 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 I'll throw out at least three possible explanations uh, which we can discuss. One concerns, I think, the reputation which Russia has gained over the last eight years under Vladimir Putin, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, but Russia has been portrayed repeatedly as a uh, unrepentantly imperial state, as a state who's abandoned the, the course of democratic reform and turned itself into an, an, an autocratic state. P people say this without n any, field to, n n any perceived need to, to, to justify or explain that Russia is an autocracy. Putin is the new Stalin. Uh, he's this tough guy, this street tough. He's bad. Russia is bad. So if Russia is bad, it must be doing bad things. And we have to, we have to point that out. That's one, perhaps, reason for this exaggerated rhetoric. The second is the title of our panel, Russia Resurgent. R Russia's not only bad, it's, it's flexing its muscles once again. It's, it's dangerous. So we have a, 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 a state out to do evil. Sa Saakashvili said this you know, in one of his many, uh, uh, I don't know what to call them, uh, emotional uh, tirades. Uh, in, in, in the wake of the Russian incursion into Georgia. I looked into the eyes of the Russians and I saw evil, unquote. Uh, Russia bad, Russia resurgent, uh, a new Russian threat. Now, if that were so, if those were accurate perceptions, if Russia was as bad as it's sometimes portrayed as being, uh, and as dangerous as sometimes portrayed as being, then perhaps the rhetoric, what I'm calling the rhetoric, would be justified. You can make an argument that it is not so. Uh, I don't have time to go into this, but certainly it's fair to argue that it, the Russian polity is in some ways more complex than this banal phrase, a, a neo-authoritarian uh, would seem to point to. It's a more complex polity than that. It's not unrepentedly bad. And of course, Russia resurgent. Russia does have, is a reviving state after having gone through it, uh, you know, one of the most dramatic collapses in, in, in modern history. It's a reviving state, but it has obvious vulnerabilities. Perhaps one of the ways to explain this gap between rhetoric and realpolitik is uh, and the fact that, that, that the, the, the threat isn't necessarily, in fact, objectively evaluated as great as it's sometimes put out to be. A uh, second way to explain this dichotomy uh, is that, of course, the, uh, the Russian incursion into, into Georgia was, and I think was certainly in, intended to be, uh, a humiliation for the United States. Uh, Saakashvili, the Georgian president, was uh, an American protege. The United States put a lot of uh, uh, resources into cultivating uh, Georgia, to building up its military, uh, to priming it for NATO membership. Uh, um, Sa Saakashvili was our man, and he's been humiliated, and Georgia's been roughed up by its Russian neighbor. Great powers, no great power likes to be humiliated like that. 
uh, if anything, uh, the, uh, the uh, fact that Saakashvili, and again, the origins of this conflict are still subject to debate and I think exploration. We don't know everything we need to know to uh, cast judgments about what exactly happened. But it, it would certainly appear that, uh, at a minimum, Saakashvili took the bait that was thrown out, uh, uh, launched a provocative assault against Tsikinvali, and uh, created a pretext for a Russian reaction. This, it, 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 if anything, the fact that we couldn't control our protege uh, uh, aggravates the humiliation. So uh, <clears throat> we need to respond. We respond rhetorically. A third reason why we don't do more is that we don't have significant positive options. And this, I think, could be considered a failure of policy, a failure of Western policy. How can we react effectively to Russia's incursion into Georgia? Almost anything that <clears throat> has been named falls apart in the light of the sun. I don't think the problem is that our, or I hope the problem is not that our, our, so many of our troops are tied down in Iraq and Afghanistan. In other words, I would like to think that even if our, our troops were not tied down in Iraq and Afghanistan, we would not be contemplating uh, launching into a shooting war with the Russian Federation in the Caucasus. That's commonly so, so I cited as a reason. I'm, I, I hope it is, it, it is not. Uh, <clears throat> The fact is that Russia's perception, as I see it, is that the Russian Federation has little to lose in, uh, in uh, you know, poking at or provoking uh, the West. We haven't given Russia a substantial stake in maintaining uh, positive relations um, with the West. Uh, how are we going to react? with a missile defense system. Well, that idea long predates the, the current crisis in the Caucasus. And we've been saying for years that this missile defense system is not aimed at Russia, is not intended uh, to, uh, to, 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 as, as a hostile gesture towards Russia. It was in the cards. It was going to happen. It would have happened whether there had been a Russian incursion into the Caucasus uh, or not. Moscow uh, certainly knows that. Uh, the Kosovo issue. It's a fait accompli. It's a fait accompli that Russia was as little prepared to react to effectively as we are prepared to react effectively to Russia's position today in Georgia, keeping Russia out of the World Trade Organization. This is, of course, anomalous. There are over 150 states in the World Trade Organization, which is supposed to be an organization that serves the mutual benefit of its members. Russia is a powerful economy. Uh, we have Haiti in the World Trade Organization. Cuba is in the World Trade Association, Venezuela, Georgia, uh, but not the Russian Federation. There's something anomalous about that. And the, the agenda for Russia in the session was stalled prior to the, uh, to the incursion into Georgia. Russia would like to be a member of the World Trade Organization. It's written into its new foreign policy concept. But it's lived without it for quite a while. The process has been very long and protracted. It can live without it for a while. It's not a particularly... Um, uh, muscular threat will keep you out of the World Trade Organization. The, 19th, uh, the 2014 Olympic Games in Sochi, apart from the issue of politicizing the Olympics, uh, uh, the Olympic ideal uh, in that egregious way, it's, 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 uh, it, it, it's not a particularly daunting prospect and, and not very likely anyway. Uh, the uh, Russia's relationship with NATO the Russia, Russia NATO Council, from which Russia has, you know, it's temporarily suspended its, its, its uh, participation anyway, in my feeling, it was never a very robust, never a sufficiently robust organization. It never gave Russia enough of a stake to make preserving it worthwhile at, at the cost of the sacrifice of interests that are perceived as vital from a Russian national uh, perspective. Markets and investments, some people have been happy to see uh, you know, the Russian stock market decline, uh, foreign invest in investment capital pull out, the market will discipline Russia. Not likely, not likely. In the long term, we hear this over and over again, the market goes where the money is. There have been, there have been other declines in the Russian stock markets, temporary declines in periods of crisis in past years. It's not likely to be a significant disciplinary uh, 
uh, dynamic, I don't think. Russia does not need to disrupt the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline. This has been pointed out as a mode of oil politics. Russia is actually doing quite well competitively in the oil and natural gas politics of the Caspian Basin uh, without going on a, out on a limb carrying out military actions. NATO enlargement, we're going to push NATO enlargement, that'll teach the Russians a lesson. We're already pushing it. We're pushing it. We pushed it very hard. It all predates this crisis. What kind of significant leverage can we pull out of our hat that's not there already? What stake does Russia have in sustaining its relations with the West? Um, that's what I call a failure of policy. Since we don't have uh, effective options, we substitute words, rhetoric. Um, <clears throat> what's One thing that's missed in all this, I mean, two more remarks, two minutes, two more remarks, one minute each. Um, one thing that's missed is the local sources of conflict itself. We call this the Russian-Georgian conflict. Everybody said the Russian-Georgian conflict. Russian what, 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 what is, it, is, you know, it also involves South Ossetia. And there are significant and complex local issues. Uh, there's more to this than Russian relations with Georgia. The Saakashvili regime has been, been criticized for a, a failure to cultivate, once in power, cultivate its relations with, with uh, its breakaway regions, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, try to use positive incentives to improve the climate of relations and, and convince these breakaway regions that, it, that they have a stake in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in their relationship with Tbilisi. Saakashvili has chosen to place the onus on Russia. The problem is Russia. The problem is not the complex nexus of relations uh, that both unite and divide Georgians, Abkhazians, and South Ossetians. The local dimension needs to be uh, put on the table. Finally, what's likely to happen in the future? I'm rather optimistic. I think that you'll see uh, 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 much less dramatic practical consequences than the rhetoric might lead you to believe. Uh, Russia will substantially pull back. Uh, the frozen conflicts will freeze up again. Uh, the wild card is, there are two wild cards. One is uh, the possibility of domestic instability inside Georgia itself once the costs of the conflict become clear. Political instability, and social instability with unpredictable consequences. The second is the Western overreaction, a dogged, determined uh, effort to get back at Russia at the expense of our own vested interest in a long-term positive working relationship with the Russian Federation in areas where we have evident mutual interests, energy security, counter-terrorism, counter-proliferation, and, and the like. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Our next speaker is uh, Provost Neil Weissman. Uh, thank you, Russ. When Russ first called me about the panel, I have to admit I sort of in knee-jerk fashion asked myself, why would Russ want an academic dean on a panel about the Russian-Georgian conflict and what, what implications might have for being an academic administrator? And I actually imagined one, which is that uh, during the Cold War, uh, enrollments in Russian language and Russian-related courses were pretty high. And ironically, in the period since, even though the opportunities to use the language and do interesting things in connection with Russia have vastly expanded, interest has fallen, and now that the Russians were reasserting themselves, I imagine, higher enrollments. Well, clearly, that's not why Russ wanted me in the panel, and it's not a critical issue here, although those of you who have heightened interest in Russia, I encourage you to follow it. Uh, clearly, Russia wanted, uh, rather, Russ wanted me because uh, I'm a historian and theoretically can talk about things in, in the long haul. Uh, and that's essentially what I want to do. I want to talk about things in the long haul, but very briefly. Uh, I suppose, you know, from my perspective the, as a historian, uh, the notion that Craig just introduced about Russia's reputation is critical. And I'm not thinking about this in terms of the eight-year span that he talked about so incisively. But I'm talking about maybe the eight-century span, long haul. And I think, to boil it down, there are two very different perspectives on how Russian history has unfolded and on the kind of reputation that Russia has and the kind of behaviors that people have come to expect from it. On the one hand, 
there is a perspective on Russia that essentially sees the country as fundamentally expansionist, that expansion and pushing on borders and pushing on neighbors, seeing the world in, ter in terms of enemies and friends, that this is somehow uh, in the Russian genetic makeup, that this is in the nature of this particular country. And so if you go back to the much earlier era, Russian history, some would argue essentially modern Russian history starts it in the little principality of Muscovy, Moscow, which was a very small principality when it was first founded, and that gradually and steadily over the decades and over the centuries expanded vastly to become literally, in terms of territory, the greatest, largest nation state on earth. And it did it both by becoming autocratic, the notion of centralized and autocratic rule is part of this bad genetic makeup that the Russians have is always there, and it did it by developing an, its own intense messianic sense of itself. One example of this, and it crops up nowadays in the newspaper reports all the time, not from the Russians, but from Westerners, is this notion of Moscow, the theory of the Third Rome, that initially um, the Rome of Catholicism was to lead the world to salvation. It became heretical. It was replaced by uh, Eastern Orthodoxy seated in Constantinople, the second Rome, it became heretical, and it was Moscow, the seat of Russian Orthodoxy, which would be the final Rome that would be the seat of human salvation, a theory that developed in 15th, 16th centuries, and, and is seen as an exemplar of this kind of Russian sense of special place in the world and of expansionist sense of self. And of course, all of this in a very different version reemerged after the Russian Revolution in 1917 when the Soviet Union adopted communist ideology, an ideology that is intrinsically has visions of world revolution that had interests beyond its own boundaries, substantial interests. And so this, the old version was got a new, form, a new format. I distinctly remember, I don't remember much about fifth grade, it was a long time ago. But I remember seeing a film about, you know, about communism in the Soviet Union, and it started with a little red dot where Moscow was, and slowly but surely that red dot spread out over ever larger territory, and it was sort of a, a visualization of what I would call the, you know, the, the expansive evil Russian sort of perspective. And I think that there are, therefore, there's an automatic reflex when Russia asserts itself to begin to think of it in these terms. And Craig's reference to those who talk about a new Cold War certainly are tending to see it in this vein. But the historical image that I think best uh, captures this in the current crisis is the notion that this is Munich all over again. Some people have brought this up. That this is like Hitler in Czechoslovakia, that if, he's, if they're allowed to get away with this, the next steps will inevitably follow. That after Georgia comes Ukraine, the Baltic states, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and that the historical analogy that's appropriate here then is that one. It is the Munich analogy. On the other side, the other perspective on Russia is very different. And it basically is a sort of a, a normal state or normal empire perspective. And the argument here is that, sure, there are lots of particulars in Russian history, as there are in the history of any country, but that the fundamental behavior of the Russian state at various times in its history is to be understood in the same kinds of general terms that you would apply to any other country or any other state. You need to look at its legitimate concerns about its own security. And people who take this point of view tend to point out, for instance, that Russia has been historically a victim as much as it's been an aggressor. It has been subjected to repeated assault from the outside, sometimes successful assault from the outside. That Russia, like any state, has its own economic interests. That Russia, like any state, worries about its status and place in the world. And that in order to understand Russian behavior, that's the perspective that, not, that needs to be taken, not the automatic assumption that there is something intrinsically aggressive and expansionist about the Russians and about the Russian state. That if you look into Russian eyes, you see essentially, to put it this way, the same set of emotions 
that you would see in anybody else's eyes. Sure, some evil, but also plenty of good and a lot of everything else. In this perspective, then, the argument would go, it stands to reason that Russia, after the catastrophic collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, from the standpoint of power, catastrophic collapse, I'm not talking about this in moral terms. I think the collapse was a good thing, all told. But that collapse, catastrophic collapse, fundamentally reduced Russia's place in the world, and over the course of the last decade, it has recovered. The Russian economy, driven chiefly by oil and gas revenues, has become substantially stronger. By some measures, it's now among the 10 largest economies in the world, so it's substantial. Internally, the country has become far more stable than it was in the 90s, that its general power in the world is substantially increased, even its military capacity is increasing again as well. And that under these circumstances, it's entirely normal and natural that a country that was a superpower isn't a superpower now, you can make a pretty good case no one is, even the United States, but is still a great power by most measures, that it would be normal and natural that a state like that would not accept provocation on its immediate borders and would expect to have influence, substantial influence, in the region immediately surrounding it. There are lots of historical analogies that could be used here to match the Hitler and Munich analogy that I mentioned earlier, but probably the best one is the Cuban Missile Crisis, in which some would argue the Soviet Union sought to exert influence on the borders of the United States, something that we found intolerable, and we moved to stop it fairly aggressively and effectively. The argument would be that this is a parallel to that, that the West in a variety of ways, including the expansion of NATO, an alliance that was originally created for the purpose of containing the Soviet Union, that this was offensive to the Russians. The Russians have made it very clear that they find Ukrainian and Georgian involvement in NATO, membership in NATO, unacceptable. The Americans have done joint military exercises with the Georgians outside of Tbilisi, right on the Russian border. And that the argument would be that, in fact, the Russians are reacting the way any great power would to these kinds of provocations. In closing, I would just make two quick comments. My own personal opinion is probably the way that I've articulated this has made it clear. In this particular case, I lean to the second point of view, that I think that the Russian response here is pretty much to be expected. And I think that it, our response to it needs to take that into consideration. I would also add, however, that recognizing the reality and to some degree I would say the normalcy of this kind of situation does not necessarily mean moral approval. The Russians in terms of their behavior in Chechnya alone as far as I'm concerned you know, have, um, have really uh, thrown away uh, any uh, possibility to, to argue that they have a, the moral high ground here. So my argument really is more on the grounds of a realistic understanding of what's happening and a response to it that's likely to produce a productive result. Thank you, Neil. Well, uh, Neil's comments about NATO makes a nice segue to uh, our next speaker, Andy Wolf, uh, who is the uh, resident expert on this panel on American foreign policy. And uh, if I'm remembering correctly, doctoral dissertation uh, on, NATO. on NATO expansion, so yes. uh, very timely. Andy. Thank you. Um, it's great to be following uh, Professor Nation and Dean Weissman. Uh, my comments are going to be a little bit of a repetition of what uh, Professor Nation has said but I think that's okay, um, because I'll be coming at it from a different point of view, a little bit more focusing on American policies. And I will be critical of not America's overall policy in this conflict, but the way its policies has been implemented. And particularly over the last, say, two or three years, and, and very, very much so uh, in 2008. So, um, it's my belief that the Bush administration could have prevented this conflict, um, not in August, not in July when paramilitary um, groups were shooting at each other, but say in February with the Kosovo in Declaration of Independence or in April at the Bucharest NATO summit. Um, and I'll get to this in a minute, why I think this. But to start off, I want to point out what U.S relations and interests are with Georgia. 
It's part of a much larger project to reconstruct Eastern Europe. And this project started in 1990. And it is a project of integrating ex-communist states into economic and military structures of the West, particularly EU and NATO, but other organizations as well. Um, there have been three, I say, projects or phases that are part of this overall policy. Those three are, firstly, getting East Germany into NATO. That occurred during the 2 plus 4 negotiations in 1990 over German reunification. The second stage or project was Clinton's enlargement. That occurred in 1999, officially. It, was, um, it brought in three countries into the NATO alliance. Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary. The third phase was under President Bush, and that was the second push for NATO enlargement um, that brought in seven countries into the alliance, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Bulgaria, and Romania. And now we are actually in the fourth phase of this overarching, long-standing project to provide security and promote democracy in Eastern Europe. This fourth phase, in my mind, has been a failure. Um, what is the fourth phase? It's more than just bringing Georgia into the NATO alliance. That, that actually is part of it. Integrating Georgia, integrating Ukraine into Western structures. It is also about resolving problems in the Balkans, finalizing the solution, or finding a solution to the Kosovo problem, and bringing the Balkan countries into Western structures. And thirdly, it is about enhancing security in Europe by constructing a ballistic missile shield. So that has been President Bush's policy. It's the latest incarnation of what the U.S. has been pursuing for at least 18 years. So what's been the problem? What's been the failure? Well, the U.S. has not been able to conduct this project like it has in the past. It's, I think it's, been blund it's basically blundered its policy because it wasn't able to unite the allies behind this project, America's Western allies, and also the U.S. did not negotiate and compromise with the Russians. U.S. did this in the 90s in the different projects. It would cut deals with Russia. You get in on the NATO-Russia Council. You'll get into the G8. Uh, we'll give you a lot of money and economic aid through the Germans. Um, we'll give you respect. We will no longer criticize you about Chechnya if you help us in a war of terror and accept our second in NATO enlargement, et cetera, et cetera. None of those compromises have been done or pursued in this latest round, okay? And I will highlight this point with the Kosovo Independence Declaration that Professor Nation already brought up. Um, this occurred this year in February. Um, basically, America gave Russia a pretext to declare South Ossetia and Abkhazia to be independent states by America's actions over Kosovo. The U.S. and some Western allies basically made a precedent that great powers could divide up at the territory integrity of a state without UN approval. And in 1999, when the Kosovo bombing occurred and the Kosovo War occurred, the settlement was that the final status of Kosovo would be determined by the UN Security Council. And America and some allies got frustrated with the Russian veto of a final solution in Kosovo. And they decided, or we decided, to circumvent the process and just go right ahead and support Kosovo, Kosovar independence. And at the time, I heard U.S. officials in D.C. say, this has nothing to do with Georgia. There will be no serious repercussions. And they were wrong. And it was not, I mean, it was clear as a bell in my mind that if you let Kosovo go independent, Russia could do the same in Moldova and particularly in Georgia where Georgian territory was under UN administration and it was supposed to be decided, the final status was supposed to be decided between the Georgians and the Russians and the South Ossetians in a UN um, conference or a UN system of negotiations. And the Russians could just circumvent that just like the Americans did a couple of months earlier. 
Secondly, the U.S. in a way caused this crisis with what happened at Bucharest. Um, this was the NATO summit and the U.S. was pushing for Georgia to get a map. That's a membership action plan. Basically, it's a uh, road map for, how, for policies that need to be implemented by a future candidate country. It's not admission into the alliance, but it's, it's like a preparation, kind of training for the alliance. Um, the U.S. wanted Georgia to get this program, but failed to get Germany and France and a few others to get on board with this project. Okay. This is, in my mind, a failure of U.S. leadership. It showed that the alliance was not unified, and I think Russia took this as a signal that the U.S. and the West would not support Georgia, and they were not serious about integrating Georgia. Because that very same month, Russia gave uh, passport rights to South Ossetians, the Abkhazians, set up government-to-government -government relations with both regions, and I think they ramped up the, the, the pressure on resolving this, this problem in Georgia to their benefit started in April, in my mind, really. So if the U.S., I think, ideally could have headed off the conflict by being a little bit more flexible on these policies. For instance, why did the U.S. have to insist that a missile shield be implemented in Central Europe? I mean, the Russians were adamant that this was unacceptable and even offered alternatives in the Caucasus region. Why couldn't the U.S. set it up in Turkey or, say, in Italy or somewhere else? But no, we were insistent that this had to go in to Poland and the Czech Republic. Also, um, this sort of, I guess I'd say, lack of leadership, lack of foresight, and unwillingness to compromise with the Russians basically left the U.S. in a poor situation when the conflict started because the U.S. had no leverage on Russia. Okay. If, if the U.S. said we're not, you know, we had decided we're going to delay building a missile shield in Central Europe or we, hey, Russia, we didn't recognize Kosovar independence and the Russians started to act belligerently in Georgia, the U.S. could threaten that we would recognize Kosovo or we would build a missile shield. But America didn't have those tools. It didn't have the leverage to apply any pressure on Russia to behave with restraint. Okay. And I think that's a poor policy on the part of the United States. Um, also, how did the U.S. behave once the fighting began? I think rather poorly. President Bush and Prime Minister Putin were in Beijing for the Olympics. Putin left the Olympics early to manage the war. President Bush did not. Um, he stayed and watched Michael Phelps swim. Uh, <laughs> he watched the Redeem team play basketball. And uh, he, he actually went on the volleyball court. I love the, the pictures of him on the sand, and he's hamming it up while there's a major conflict going on in the Caucasus region. He should have been displaying world leadership. He should have cut his trip short to send a signal that the United States is taking this seriously. And he didn't send out any serious signals until he got back to the United States, and the conflict had already stopped. I mean, the damage was done, and what he did is he ceded to the Russians the ability to paint the conflict the way the Russians wanted to. America lost the PR battle. So, not ideal. What's been happening since then? Uh, basically, the U.S. has been supporting Georgia massively, um, given about $38 million in humanitarian aid. There, there are military personnel in Georgia right now um, setting up refugee camps. Um, and President Bush last week announced a billion dollar proposal to give economic aid to Georgia. Um, just to put this in perspective, that would put Georgia as the number three recipient of U.S. economic aid uh, behind Israel and Egypt. Um, that's not including Iraq because that's another issue, but um, it's a major infusion, a billion dollars. Last year, Georgia received about 63 million from the U.S. And that figure does not include military aid, which is, hasn't been determined yet. Um, 
the only serious repercussions the U.S. has imposed is, suspend, is suspending the NATO-Russia Council. Um, European allies have, have also suspended um, negotiations with Russia, um, but that's about it. And Vice President Cheney was in the region just over the weekend and last week, and he said that Georgia will be in the alliance. Um, he made that promise. That's a hollow promise. It's meaningless because Georgia can't get into the alliance until it has its border disputes settled. That's a criteria of enlargement. And I don't see its border disputes being settled anytime soon. Um, so, to sum up, uh, the U.S. is in a pickle. Um, it's in a bind. It's had, I think, a failed policy. Um, the policy itself is not so bad, integrating Georgia into Western structures. I think that's a very um, worthy endeavor. But the way it was implemented was without flexibility and without any sorts of nuance. Um, and so now we have a situation where Georgia is carved up. Um, there's nothing that can be done about that. Um, no military options are available. Diplomatic options are weak because the Western allies are divided. And it's just my hope that Georgia will continue to exist in some form as a sovereign state, truncated, I think it will, um, and that I hope that the U.S. is able to internationalize the peacekeeping effort um, so, that, so that Russia alone is not the sole guarantor of peace and war in the region. Um, maybe the European allies will um, be able to provide forces and peacekeeping forces so that in the future it won't be such a, uh, a unilateral decision by a great power. Um, so that's it. Okay, thank you, Andy. <laughs> We've heard now from uh, three colleagues, uh, political scientists and historians. Uh, our last speaker will give us uh, a slightly different perspective. Uh, Elena Isakova is a visiting instructor from the Russian State University for the Humanities. She teaches uh, Russian language and literature. Uh, but was in Moscow, right, uh, when, when the crisis uh, hit the news. And so I think she has a very unique perspective to bring uh, on the issues. Okay. So, <clears throat> so for more than two centuries, the Caucasus has been a hot spot of eth ethnic and territorial conflicts. Russian governments have always been conscious of how unstable and situation is in Northern Caucasus and how potentially dangerous uh, any political miscalculations could be. Um, even Soviet leaders were quite um, aware of seriousness of the Caucasus issue. For example, uh, if you go to Lenin's, Vladimir Lenin's uh, memorial office, uh, which preserves uh, the ambience of Lenin's last years of power, the focal point on the wall is the map of the Caucasus, which describes in detail ethnic complexity of the region. So during Soviet times, when the various autonomous regions in the Caucasus were parts of one country, uh, the borders were established based on particular administrative rather than ethnical or political considerations. As I imagine, the Cumberland County and Adams counties were once established. Uh, thus, Ossetia was divided into northern and southern sections with the northern one assigned to Russia and the southern one to Georgia. Uh, similarly, when the Crimea was signed or presented by Khrushchev to Ukraine, it was more of a symbolic act. In the end of the central Soviet government was still in charge. In 19, <clears throat> so while under the Soviet regime, the ethnic conflicts were frozen, that is may uh, remained unresolved though inactive, the collapse of the Soviet Union inevitably led to reignitement of many of them, including that between Abkhazians and Georgians and Southern Ossetians and Georgians. In 1992, 
there were serious and bloody conflicts between Georgia on the, on, on the one hand and Abkhazians, Ossetians, and Adjarians in the other. The conflict in early 90s did not resolve any territorial issues. Russian peacekeeping forces have been serving the function of keeping the fire down. Incidentally, the agreement establishing peacekeeping forces in southern Ossetia and Abkhazia was signed by Russian and by Georgian governments in 90s. So as you can see, the complex situation in northern Caucasus requires a wise approach. Wisdom is what Georgian president, uh, as Russian people think, uh, lacks. He is a young and ambitious president who wants to resolve all the issues he inherited with his presidency at once. And it is a prevalent opinion in Russia that the latest conflict in southern Ossetia is a result of the, these hasty and unwise decisions. Uh, there is another aspect of that conflict which is worth uh, mentioned. It is important to note that the majority of the population of these two problematic regions, ethnic Abkhazians and uh, Thousand Ossetians, chose to have Russian citizenship. Some did uh, because their family members have Russian citizenship, others because of economic opportunities which a Russian passport gives to its holder nowadays, others for some other reasons. Thus, the will of the Ossetian people does not coincide with the plans of the Georgian government. In addition, in 2006, Thousand Ossetia put together documents stating that there are no sound or legal grounds for Thousand Ossetia to be considered a part of Georgia. It is interesting to note that during so-called Russian aggression, the overwhelming number of Ossetian refugees left for Russia rather than Georgia. The fact of massive exodus of Ossetians into Russia as well as the fact of humanitarian aid uh, uh, from common Russian people to those who suffered from Georgian aggression has been broadly covered in Russian mass media. I want to point out that Russians seem to be especially bothered by the obvious double standards existing in the world. For example, when the United States bombed Yugoslavia without United Nations uh, sanction, it's an act that led to over 2,000 civilian deaths. There, there is an opinion among many Russians, uh, an opinion supported by the mass media, that the West, and especially the United States, has contributed to fomenting ethnic conflicts in border regions of Russia in order to create a buffer zone around Russia. Unfortunately, the United States efforts involve the countries which in, with which Russia has long established relationships. Russia and Georgia, like Russia and Ukraine, are intertwined so closely, not only in their history and politics, but also culturally, that they are unextrictable. History shows that long-term cultural connections are much more enduring than calculated political affiliation. From Pushkin to Tolstoy, from Denelia to Badrov, this connection has been expressed for centuries. And one of the most beautiful and beloved poem of Pushkin 
begins as follows. Upon the Georgian hills there lies the haze of night. Aragva murmurs underneath. I am sad, but my soul is light, my sorrows bright, my sorrows filled with you. На холмах Грузии лежит ночная мгла. Шумит Арагва предо мною. Мне грустно и легко. Печаль моя светла. Печаль моя полна тобою. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, before we get to the Q&A, uh, one of the things the Clark Forum has begun to uh, do this year is to give an opportunity for people in the audience who simply want to make a comment uh, or an observation about the situation uh, under discussion. Uh, and so let me open up the floor to that first. If anybody has any comments, observations, things you want to add, uh, the only rule is instead of giving you 10 minutes, we'll give you 90 seconds. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and please wait for someone with a microphone to come around. Uh, thank you all very much. Spasiba very much. Um, I just want to respond briefly to Ms. Isakova's presentation. I thought it was very well done. Thank you. Um, just, uh, you mentioned that all the refugees were going to Russia from South Ossetia. And one of the principal reasons for that was that it was Russia who was taking these refugees in convoys to Vladikavkaz. Most of these refugees didn't really have any other options. They couldn't go to Tbilis. The Russian army was advancing there and both the Russian and Georgian military had a series of checkpoints, so evacuation in North Ossetia through the Roki Tunnel was really their only option. Uh, secondly, you said that North, division of North and South Ossetia into the Georgian and Russian uh, Federation Soviet Union was mainly an administration, administrative decision, but um, as a matter of fact, there's a long history of separation between South and North Ossetia, and Ossetia really hasn't been united for hundreds of years. Um, and additionally, you talked about um, the significance of uh, Georgian Russian culture through an examination of its poetry. And I think one of the reasons that all the poets wrote about Georgia was, yes, it's very beautiful, it's scenic, it has a place in Russian culture, but they were also military officers who served in the Caucasus. I also recall Mikhail Lermontov writing about Dagestan, where he in fact died in a duel. And he was there for military service and was shot by a fellow officer. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other comments before we get to the Q&A? Can we respond to this? Yeah, so... Uh, do, do you want to... You want to respond? Um, so, yeah, so I would like to th okay. thank you for a very interesting notice. And I also feel you should also mention a Georgian... Um, um, uh, <clears throat> person uh, whose name is Bagration, who served for Russian army and helped Russia to uh, uh, to help with Napoleon army. So it also has to be mentioned. <laughs> I, I just okay. want Lermontov was not killed in Dagestan; he was killed in, in a duel in Piatigorsk. And uh, secondly, of course, uh, the accessions were citizens of one state in the context of the Soviet Union. So it's a little hard to argue they were in some harsh way divided. North and, set to, and South Ossetia were part of a single state and, and the residents shared a common citizenship. That should, that, I think we should remember that. Is there another comment back there? If not, let's go to just questions, questions and answers. This is a question, I guess, uh, regarding U.S. foreign policy towards Russia. Uh, you mentioned uh, the project that started uh, stabilizing Eastern, well, Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, there was a question, though, who lost Russia? And I know that Clinton's administration was uh, accused of that. But what, you, I, what, you, what do you personally think about Bush administration and how, if, what, what is his share? in this question of losing Russia, if something like this can be, if something like this can be answered. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, that's a great question, and honestly, I think no one has an, a great answer of who lost Russia. Um, it's, 
I don't think you can blame Americans for losing Russia. It's just, it wasn't ours to lose. We never had Russia to begin with. Um, we tried to, in the 90s, we tried to encourage them to reform and to um, institute liberal market policies. I, I'm going to interrupt. Yeah. That, that's George Kennan's famous line, uh, the who lost China yeah. debate. I, I didn't know we had China until we lost it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but these, you know, these policies didn't work in the 90s because Russia went through a massive economic depression. It was bad in Russia in the 90s. It was not a good place. And then 1998, with the, uh, with the East Asian crisis, also hit Russia. That also severely affected Russia. And I think that is what hampered the democratization process in Russia, is that they went through a Great Depression. And you can't, I, you can't have democratization if people can't eat people have trouble getting a job, if people's life expectancy was declining, and that's what has happened. So, um, and how much is Bush a part of this? I think Bush could have helped Russian relations by maybe including them more in the war against terror. Um, I don't think our military would have liked that. Um, but I think having them involved in Afghanistan, well, that was, that's actually too, too touchy, you couldn't do that. But having them involved in Iraq or having them involved some way in uh, policing, uh, greater security cooperation, intelligence cooperation, that might have helped things a little bit. But uh, besides that, I don't, I don't think Bush is the one that caused uh, the problems between America and Russia as far as uh, governance is concerned. If I could just add a comment, I, I, I really have problems with the whole formulation as has already been indicated about losing Russia because it does imply it was ours to have or to mold. But I, I think there's another implication of it that's very troubling and that is the assumption that somehow lost means therefore they're adversaries and therefore we can't have cooperative relations with them anymore. And I think it would be a tragic mistake if Americans or American policymakers, and they're not, I think, but if they made the assumption that we can't have collaborative relationships with Russia, um, it's going to cause us no end of grief, because I, not only because such relationships are, pos are possible, but we need them in a number of vital areas. And so we ought to be careful about thinking in us versus them, black and white, friend, enemy terms in this regard. There's a, 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 a pretty detailed book about American-Russian policy by Michael McFowl and James Goldguy, which is three or four years old, I think, mm -hmm. now. But it sort of doc, tries to document, uh, you know, an effort, on the, and it's a bipartisan effort in the sense it's shared by Republican and Democratic administrations uh, to maintain, uh, uh, you know, uh, some kind of, they use the word partnership with, with Russia. I, I think a better question would be, why does that effort produce so little that's <laughs> substantial. Um, um, I, I think in part it has to do with this Russia's sorry state in the 1990s which was sort of, a, a, we, we get addicted to, to, to taking Russia for granted. But it's not so easy to do that now. Incidentally, there are 15 students in the room who are reading that book this semester. Oh, no. so. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice plug, thank you. Other questions? Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here. Forgive me if this question sounds ignorant because prior to basically tonight, I had very little knowledge of the goings on in this region. Um, this is for a little bit in response to um, this gentleman's comments about South and North Ossetia. If Russia has decided to declare South Ossetia independence, whatever that means for the world, do they have the same expectations for North Ossetia to then reunite, or is that is North Ossetia going to stay with Russia and South Ossetia be by itself? Yeah, uh, one one comment, one observation in general: um, the number of states who have actually recognized the independence of South Ossetia, you can count on the fingers of one hand. I think what is it? Maybe is it Venezuela, <laughs> uh, Nicaragua. Nicaragua. Yeah. Um, uh, they recognize each other too. Pardon me. South Ossetia and Abkhazia recognized each other. That's, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the you know so the uh, the declaration of in, uh, of Indi uh, the recognition of the sovereignty and independence of these states has been uh, relatively has been limited uh, clearly. Um, there, there were some who were concerned, I think, initially that um, you know annexation of South Ossetia might be uh, in the offing, um, but that is not you know. Uh, Apparently not in the cards. 
South Ossetia's position has always been that it, that it would prefer to, to uh, be incorporated in the Russian Federation. Yes, uh, so I, I wonder how long can Russia be resurgent if the demographic decline you can read about continues to pace in the you know, next 20, 30, 40 years? Well, uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> And it really goes to, I think, a larger question of how deep the resurgence of Russia that we see um, really goes, or whether or not it conceals, or what seems to be a resurgence, conceals some fundamental weakness of Russia's position, not only internationally, uh, but at home. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, aside from the demographic problem, for those of you who aren't familiar with this, Russia, ha Russia has a demographic problem. People are dying at a faster rate than they're being born. And depending on what projections you look at, uh, by the middle of the next century, the Russian population uh, can be, may very well be significantly smaller than it is, uh, is today. Uh, but beyond that, there's also the economy, right? Uh, Russia has been, uh, it's been, you know, fairly good times in the Russian economy over the last uh, seven or eight years or so. But I think as someone mentioned earlier in uh, one of the earlier sets of comments, that's largely been driven by oil prices at 125, 135 uh, dollars, uh, dollars per barrel. Um, to the extent that uh, oil prices uh, decline, uh, that has severe implications for the Russian economy. I looked up some numbers on the internet just today, for example, 80% uh, of Russian export uh, revenues are, are generated by oil and gas. Uh, about half of the Russian state budget uh, is uh, uh, dependent upon uh, revenues uh, from, from the energy sector. And a larger problem related to that uh, is that it has allowed, as is often the case in countries that are very heavily dependent on resources, particularly energy, uh, it has allowed them to defer some very difficult structural reforms of the economy, um, uh, infrastructure, um, um, uh, domestic prices of gas uh, need to be uh, marketized. Um, and so there's a lot of um, question about how deep the economic recovery that we've seen apparently in the, uh, the last seven or eight years goes and what will happen if in fact uh, the worst predictions about peak oil don't materialize and oil prices as they have been in recent weeks uh, continue to drop down to 90, 80, 70 dollars a barrel. That would be I think problematic for the Russian Rocking economy. Basement prices. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would also note that Russia isn't the only country that has this kind of demographic dilemma, although it's particularly severe in the case of Russia. Actually, Russia's birth rate is higher than a number of other European countries, like Spain and Italy. Um, it's far from being, uh, you know, at a level that would replace the population, but it's, it's not the birth rate. It's, I, I, my students at the War College always, uh, I, I, I may use the unfortunate phrase, it's mort mortality that is killing them, and, I, <laughs> and I've, never, I've never been forgiven for it. But they have a, this, this, this very low life expectancy for the uh, a male population is, is really a, a peculiar aspect of Russian reality. The government's aware of it. They uh, are, are trying to address it. And actually, it's, you could be counted, I think, as a, a significant failure on the part of the Putin government. It has not been a, a, able to affect, uh, address that effectively. It's a, and it's a, it exists for many reasons, cultural and, 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 and uh, sociopolitical, I think, both. But it's a real dilemma for Russia, no doubt about it. But also, it's a long-term process, this process of demographic dec decline. You know. in, in talking about demography, it's also worth distinguishing between the Russian population overall, that's one thing, and the Russian ethnic population as compared to other ethnic populations within Russia. Russia has a substantial Muslim population that is not suffering the decline that the ethnic Russians are, and that's potentially, maybe yes, maybe no, potentially a concern as well for them. Um, one common theme that I've heard tonight is that uh, one of the reasons that this conflict escalated so quickly and so severely was that there wasn't um, enough leverage, or the U.S. and the rest of the West did not have enough leverage on Russia, and therefore Russia had no stake in behaving in a more acceptable manner. Um, I guess my question is that why has the international community resisted, or um, why has there been such a lack of an effort to integrate Russia into the economic international community, especially 
it seems that since Russia is the 10th largest economy, it wouldn't be that difficult to use a more of a global straitjacket approach such as um, policies with China. No one wants to take that. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're the American, you're American, foreign, us. You're the American foreign policy exactly. guy, Andy. No. Um, the, Clinton promised Russia would get into the WTO. He made that promise, I think, in 1996, so 12 years ago. Um, it's been held up in con – there's been opposition in Congress to let Russia in. There was a lot of opposition to let China in in Congress. Um, I mean, China's not getting in Congress, that was a Freudian slip, but to let China and the WTO. Um, I think it's a problem that America doesn't trade a whole lot with Russia. I mean, the U.S. trades a lot with China, a whole lot. And trade with Russia is expanding, uh, energy trade, and they're building um, liquid, uh, what is it, LNGs, liquid naturalized gas. Um, facilities to transport natural gas to America, et cetera. Um, uh, but in all, I think it's just basically there's not a lobby within the U.S. to get Russia in. Um, Europe, however, that's a different question. I don't know why the Europeans have not pushed for um, Russia to get in the WTO. And I think partly because part of the reason is maybe they've been distracted with EU expansion and EU enlargement. It's been so tricky and they've been so focused on building their common market and the euro and they've had a lot of difficulties negotiating with Europe, with Russia on a bilateral basis, the EU and Russia, on all sorts of trade agreements. Um, let's say from Poland there's been disputes over Polish beef and sausages um, and uh, there have been Energy policy has not been united as far as Europe is concerned. They have not had a common position with how to obtain energy resources from Russia. And some states don't get any uh, energy resources from Russia, such as Portugal, Spain. They don't, they're not dependent on Russia at all, whereas Germany is. So um, I think there is just not a concerted lobby to push for Russia to get in the WTO. Although we, 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 we do support, we have worked out all the issues mm -hmm. with Russia as concerning WTO. It's not really American, American that stands in the way. It's, it's the process. Georgia, in part, is blocking Russian accession to WTO at the moment. I, I think it's a very good question, and um, I think it's a question that's d difficult to answer because the answer isn't self-evident. Uh, um, why isn't Russia a can, uh, perceived as a candidate for, for these famous Euro-Atlantic institutions, uh, like uh, all the states surrounding it, uh, NATO and the EU? Well, in part, it's because Russia is so big. So if you attach Russia to anything, it, it automatically changes the nature of the organization it's joining. It's, so com it's more complex. Uh, there, there is a little bit of Orientalism about this, that, that, that Russia is uh, the East, in the sense that Central European nations are, are perceived not to be. Um, Russia has not been an uh, aggressive candidate to join these organizations. I, I always have thought that bringing Russia into NATO would be a good idea. Um, but, but, but Russia itself is not, may, maybe because it's never been a practical option, in fact, but Russia itself has never been enthusiastic about the idea. It doesn't want to be constrained in that way, perceives itself, Russia has a great power tradition, it perceives itself as an independent center of power and authority, which it has traditionally been. Uh, as one Russian actually said to me, we don't want to be one of 27 potted plants. Uh, we want to be an independent center of authority. So there's, you know, there, I think the answers to this question have to do with dynamics on both sides of this line. The idea is now out there that, you know, it, it's also something Russia has vaunted. We need a, a, a new European security pact. We need to move beyond Cold War institutions. NATO is divisive. It's a, it's a relic of the Cold War that divides. We need to step beyond it and start, start talking in, again in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Euro-Atlantic security from, I was used to say, Vancouver to Vladivostok. Uh, 
well, this is a sort of a visionary idea, but these institutions have a life of their own. They have vested interest in their own survival and perpetuation. Um, I don't know that it, it, it's a real difficult challenge to, to get beyond, and it's a very good question to think about, a difficult one to answer. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Um, my question is about our support of Georgia. Um, it was mentioned that as part of our plan to kind of democratize and modernize these former Soviet republics, we provided a bunch of military assistance to them. And my question is, how much did that sort of contribute to Russia's feeling of, let's say, encirclement, or that we were trying to use Georgia as a puppet and then apply a double standard to them? And is this whole Russia resurgent idea really just a smokescreen to hide the fact that our policies might have had a pretty big cause in this whole fiasco? Well, uh, I guess I'll take the answer first. Quickly, I mean, the U.S. has supplied Georgia with arms. It has trained its soldiers. Um, Georgia is or was the third largest contingent in Iraq, and they were a very um, active member in the Iraq invasion and policing in Iraq. Um, so there are a lot of American-Georgian ties that are not related to what's happening in the caucus. Um, but have to relate to what's happening in the Middle East. And so is it per se, can't you say that uh, America arming Georgia is what has provoked Russia? That's what the Russians think. I mean, they actually say that. They say that the U.S. instigated this conflict by supporting this rogue state, Georgia. Um, they didn't use the term rogue state, but belligerent. Uh, what were some of the other terms they used? Uh, uh, um, Genocide. Genocidal, yeah, I guess that, that would be a rogue state. Um, no, I don't think that's the case. I, I don't think that the two have much to do with each other, except in the eyes of Russia. They think it has a lot to do with it, and that's what matters. And the U.S. should have explained or been able to explain better that, no, we're not encircling you. We're supplying Georgia with arms because they're fighting in Iraq. Um, they're supporting us in our policies. We're not trying to arm them to attack you and at all. And the, I guess the point was brought up, why didn't the U.S. restrain its protege? And I would like to know that answer because, I mean, I heard that the Americans were not surprised by the invasion of August 7th, the official kickoff of the war. Um, the Americans knew about it and they tried to talk the Jordans out of it, but they wouldn't hear it. Um, they didn't listen. I don't know if I believe that account. I just don't know if the Americans were very much involved or if the Georgians just wouldn't listen to us or if we were kind of wink, wink, don't do this. I just don't know. Um, and I think that is a more of a concern than whether or not we armed the, their military. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question either, but if the, if the United States was winking when they said that, it was a very foolish yeah. you know, calculation. To, the other argument has been posed that, and this, this is things we don't know yet, we don't know the answers to these questions, but that, um, you know, that, I mean, you remember that Russia uh, uh, conducted a major act military exercise, major, but uh, it conducted a, a military exercise which concluded on the 2nd of August, Kavkaz 08, which uh, was basically a, a dress rehearsal for the invasion of George. And the, the argument has put forward that, been put forward that, you know, the, 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 the Russians are ready to go, the, uh, the uh, Georgians were provoked intentionally. Uh, Saakashvili took the bait and, and the flag went up. So that, that, that Russia staged managed uh, this, this yeah. invasion in its own uh, interests. I, this is a very interesting argument. I, I, I think it's dubious for certain reasons, but uh, you know, it's not clear. It's, you know, no, no, all the, the, the facts we need to have to make a, a definitive adjustment about, ju judgment about what sparked this conflict in the first place. I, I would like to say that the Americans were also conducting a military exercise in July this month, and it was called Operation Immediate Response. And it was with American troops, Armenians, some Azerbaijani, and Georgians about if a country invaded Georgia, what would we do? And that was occurring while the Russians had their military operation north of the border. So 
I think, I think people got a little too excited playing with their toys. <laughs> If I could put, end by putting in a plug, uh, later on this semester, I don't remember the date, we're having the panel on uh, the elections, and one of the panels is talking about uh, international issues, foreign policy issues, and their implications for the elections. I guess it's the week before the election. And when we were putting the panel together, um, there was, yeah, this was before the, uh, the crisis in the, in the Caucasus, and there wasn't much, you know, there wasn't much attention in the, uh, in the election. Well, there, there still isn't that much attention in the election campaign to things Russian, but there was virtually none at that point in time. But now all of a sudden, uh, this becomes an important issue for the election as well, because I do think that, uh, at least if you um, looked at past things that uh, John McCain and Obama have said on this issue, that the approach to dealing with Russia may very well be uh, the American approach to dealing with Russia after the election might very well be impacted by what the uh, outcome of that election might be. So come to the panel uh, uh, the week before the, uh, the election, and uh, this will be one of many foreign policy issues that will be discussed in that context. Uh, let me just thank uh, the four panelists. Uh, let me thank all the students and the Clark Forum uh, people who helped organize this, and of course, most of all, members of the audience for your attendance and your, your very good questions. Thank you. So thank you to the panelists. That concludes our event for this evening. Thank you all for coming and have a great evening.